You are listening to episode number 45 of the Everything Ham Radio podcast. This week, or this episode, we're going to be talking about net controls. We're going to be talking about the Columbia Amateur Radio Club in Columbia, South Carolina, in our Amateur Radio Club spotlight. We're going to be talking about some upcoming events and contests and some ham fests for the next two weeks, and then wrap it all up with some news from around the hobby. So, stay tuned. Hey everybody, welcome back to the Everything Ham Radio Podcast. My name is Curtis, my call sign is Kilo5 Charlie Lima Mike, and I am the host of this podcast. This podcast is released every Thursday morning, like super bright and early, so you can download it before you head off to work and you can listen to me on your way to work. Isn't that doesn't that sound like fun? <laughs> Um, you can follow me on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash everything ham radio, on YouTube at youtube.com forward slash everything ham radio, and on Twitter at K5CLM. So, today we're going to be talking about net controls. And more specifically, probably we're going to be talking about how to be a net control. Now, a net control is, I'm sure everybody knows, it's basically just the, the person that, that you talk to on the net. You know, if it's a directed net, you know, their job is to maintain the tra- maintain the channel or the frequency and the repeater and all that good stuff and make sure that traffic is handled properly and not everybody's talking at once. You know, that's their job. It's, it's basically the amateur radio version of what I do professionally as a dispatcher. So um, anyways, we're going to be talking about that. And then a little bit later, we're going to be talking about the Columbia Amateur Radio Club in Columbia, South Carolina. Um, in our Amateur Radio Club spotlight, we got some upcoming events and contests, as well as some hand fests uh, for the next two weeks. And then we're going to wrap it up with some news. Um, luckily, I am starting on this early this week, um, as if you listen to last episode, episode number 44, you'll realize that uh, I didn't really have a, a general topic that I was talking about. I was just basically just talking, kind of like what I'm doing now. <laughs> but anyways, um, you know, I luckily got it out. Um, at, I recorded it at like 5 o'clock in the morning or something like that, Wednesday morning, the day before it goes out, and I had a scramble to get it all together because I was sick all last week. Um, I got sick from... I don't know if it was from my two-year-old or from my wife or from one of my other kids, but um, yeah, I got sick, and I was sick like all day Wednesday. Uh, I worked Thursday and Friday and Saturday, and finally by Sunday I started to feel better, um, and I started to get try to get some stuff recorded. Um, I got the spotlight recorded. I got the the news and events and and uh, ham fest and all that recorded. But I didn't have the main meat of the podcast uh, or the ep- of the episode, the tech corner, as I call it, that segment. So um, I had to kind of figure out what I was going to do. And with my long honeydew list, it, it didn't leave me a whole lot of time. Well, it just so happened that one of my daughters. Um, was going on a field trip at her school um, on Wednesday, and she had to be at school at 6 o'clock. So that means we had to get up early. And the school that she's going to, um, because she's only temporarily with us, um, CPS wanted to keep her in the school that she's at, um, is like 30 to 35 miles away from me. So that's, you know... 35 miles one way four times a day basically so it's it's been fun but anyways we had to get up at like 4 30 well you know it's really no big deal for me because i do that you know at least half a week every week because uh, that's when i have to get up to come to work but anyways so i got up and i did it well this time i'm a little bit more prepared uh here it is thursday and it is like uh three o'clock three thirty in the afternoon or so and I still have two more hours of work to do, and it's been a relatively nice day today, so uh, I'm actually able to get a little bit done. So I've gotten a whole bunch of research done, um, got everything lined up as, as far as everything but the tech corner goes, um, and then the tech corner thing, I'm just kind of going to go, 
I guess maybe just kind of, kind of wing it because you know you think about it. I've I've been doing, um, I've been a 911 dispatcher now for uh, about 12, 12 and a half years or so, and I've been a ham now for 20 plus years. And of those, I've been uh, I've been in net control pretty much since like year two or so. So I've I, 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 probably have a whole bunch of experience so I really don't need to write anything down right now I'm not going to say that I'm not going to write anything down or I'm not going to do any research on it because there is great ideas out there that other people have um, that I learn you know you learn every day every day if you don't learn you're not living right so try to learn something every day so you can stay alive <laughs> but anyways um, you know being in net control is awesome at, at least for me, I don't. I don't know. You know, some some people are like adrenaline junkies, and I guess maybe I am too, to a certain degree. You know, I don't go jump off buildings or off cliffs or go skydiving or or whatever. But you know that that feel that you, that feeling that you get when you get a emergency situation. You know, and your adrenaline starts pumping, and, and you you know your senses heighten and your training kicks in. It, those are the times that it, I like. Now, sometimes I don't like them all that much because, you know, they say that, you know, when you're busy, you know, work goes by fast. Well, it, that's not always the case, and unfortunately. Yeah, if you're constantly busy, then maybe, okay, then maybe it goes a lot faster. But if you're busy in spurts, then it's kind of bad. But then also, on the flip side of that, you know, you get all this stuff that you're doing, and, and you look at the clock, and it's only been like 15 minutes, and it's like, you know, how did I fit all this stuff in a 15-minute window? That should be like three hours. But, you know, anyways. So, yeah, I guess I could say that I'm a, a somewhat of a, an adrenaline junkie. So, like I said, a net control basically maintains control of the frequency, right, and all the people that are in there that are on a net and you know that could be 10 people it could be 100 people but they're the one that's ultimately in charge they're the one that uh, has the say so on what you can do whether you can you know talk to um, you know Joe Blow or whether you can't you know they're they're basically in control of it and you know, depending on what kind of net you're using is depending on how strict the net control is going to be. So, anyway, with a net control, you know, some good qualities, okay, let's say. Uh, let's see, good qualities of being a net control. Um, I would say one of them is definitely listening, right? Uh, you definitely have to know how to listen uh, if you're going to be a net control because you have to hear everything. Um, the other thing I would say is that you need good uh, hand-eye coordination, um, or at least maybe not coordination, but like um, hand, or eye, or not eye, but ear, good ear to hand translations, you know, like, um, you know, writing down everything that you hear, whether it is uh, what somebody says, whether, um, you know, where they're at, what their call sign is, and stuff like that. So having a good ear to hand um translation that I that's not the word that I'm looking for but um, you know that's coordination maybe ear to hand coordination um, but anyways you need to have, have that right and you also need from like you need some good uh, multitasking skills right um, if you can't multitask then you might have issues because a lot of times with being a net control um, you're going to have multiple radios. You're going to have multiple people talking to you. Um, I know here locally, uh, when I used to run our Skywar net, I would have our VHF uh, repeater, our UHF repeater, our two main ones, and then I'd also have um, a another a backup repeater, backup UHF repeater. Um, I would have the HF radio on. Um, I would have the uh, emergency manager in the same room with me talking on the phone, um, you know, and several other things. So there's a bunch of stuff that you need to pay attention to, but it can be really overwhelming. So the more radios that you have, the more things that you have to listen to, the more people you really need to help you. Um, and, you know, that could be 
whether it's somebody logging for you or whether it is uh, somebody taking another frequency um, you know a lot of times you can set up multiple nets you know if you have say like you have a tornado come through um, you might have one general net where everybody is and then you have another net going that um, is keeping track of of what resources you have you know say like um, you have an aftermath of a tornado and you have uh, five teams of searchers out and you have a radio operator with each pers uh, with each team and you have say four other people that are on break or that are standing by in your staging area so you might have a, a person that is maintaining a list of, of what resources that you have and that's who you talk to when you're not actively searching. You talk on a resource net instead of the main net. Um, I'm getting a little ahead of myself here, but you know that's that's what I'm talking about. Okay, see, so when your net controller, there's a lot going on, so you really need to multitask. So let's see what else. What else makes a good quality of being a net control? Um, how about a good speaking voice? Um, you really need to be able to. Speak clearly and speak clo uh, slowly to a certain degree, um, but you also need to be able to uh, pronunciate so that people can hear you. You know, you don't want to be a person that you know holds the mic a foot and a half away from their mouth, and everybody has to crank up the volume to hear you. And then when somebody else talks, they're super loud, right? And you also don't want to be that person that has the microphone right it next to their mouth um, so that they're super loud or they're overdriven and distorted um, so you, you also you know you need to pay attention to where your mic is you need to be able to pronunciate your words um, you need to be able to talk clearly I guess really is is the main thing um, so yeah speaking clearly you definitely need to, need to have that um, and that's really um, something that you can learn and all this, you know, all this stuff here is something that can be learned. Okay, so what else? Um, something else to make a good quality or a good quality of being in a control. Um, how about maybe good handwriting? Uh, it kind of goes with the ear to hand up there. Maybe you know, either good handwriting or good computer skills or good typing skills, stuff like that. Um, so, because there's going to be a lot of information coming in, uh, coming in over the radio that you need to be able to write down or type out and understand later on, right? So let's see, um, next probably a good quality would be uh, you know, works good under pressure, right? Because you're going to have a lot of people talking to you, you're going to have things coming at you from different, you know, different sides of you, different ears, different, you know, people telling you what to do from behind and on the radio and all that, so working good under pressure is a good thing. Um, another thing, um, decision making skills. Um, you know, decision making skills is like probably one of the uh, most. Oh, I'm, I'm having a hard time making a decision here. Um, probably one of the most needed things um, to have good decision making skills and the reason that I say that is because you need to be able to make a choice you need to be able to tell somebody what to do where to do it how to do it you know whether it's time to evacuate or whether it's time to go in or whatever you need to be able to make that decision under pressure and this goes and goes with you know good under pressure so you need to be able to make uh, make decisions and you need to do it easily fast or whatever Another thing that you need to make sure that you do with uh, your decisions is stick to them. Uh, I mean, once you make a decision, stick to your decision, whether it's good or bad. Stick to it. And unless you have a reason to change, um, be, be confident enough in your decision, whether it's right or wrong, to make that decision. Because that's, you know, one of the things. And, and that goes for more than just being that control. That could be, you know... Um, you know, being a supervisor or, um, you know, being a, a 
soccer mom <laughs> driving a bunch of kids to, to 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 work or to soccer practice. You know, making that decision, sticking to that decision, and whether it's a good decision or a bad decision, you live with the consequences. Um, so, anyways, that I really can't think of any other um, qualities per se. Um, of a good net control. If you can think of any that I've missed, please um, leave a comment in the show notes uh, of what you think a, a good quality would be, or uh, leave a comment on Facebook, or um, tweet me, or whatever. But let me know if you think of any other good examples of qualities to be a net control. Okay, so we're going to take a quick break here, uh, and we'll be right back, so stay tuned. Hey everybody, just want to take a quick break here. Um, last episode I mentioned that I was trying to do get some shirts or stuff made up for uh, my podcast. Well, I am still working on that, and I'm hoping that um, the 1st of December or so I will have those up and ready to go. Um, I'm still trying to get some of the material together, um, but I'm going to put them on the website for you to pre-order. Um, if you so choose to, and you know, not only will this help me get some of the materials I need to make the shirts, but it'll also guarantee that you'll have one of the first ones available. So make sure you check back um, on the podcast episode on December the first, uh, which will be the next episode after this one, and uh, to find out how and where to go to to get your Everything Ham Radio t-shirt. Um, I'm also going to have other stuff other than just a Everything Ham Radio uh, podcast t-shirt. Going to have other types of uh, ham radio um, t-shirts um, and several other uh, categories, I guess you could say. And as well as um, custom made things. Um, so stay tuned for that. Make sure you tune in, in next episode to find out where you can go to pre-order your very own Everything Ham Radio podcast t-shirt. So stay tuned next episode, and uh, what do you say we get back to our topic of today? Okay, so we've talked about uh, several characteristics of what would make a good net control. Let's talk about some general uh, practices or um, things that you need to do as a net control. Okay, one of the things that is a absolute stickler for me, and this goes not only with uh, my amateur radio net control experience, but also as a 911 uh, dispatcher. You know, one thing you always want to make sure you know is where everybody is. You know, if you are running a emergency net, if you're run, running a Skywarn net or something like that, you always want to make sure you know where everybody is. That way, in case something happens, uh, you know where to send help, right? And case in point here, um, we had, and it, actually this goes a little bit with the next one too, so I'm going to go ahead and go with that first. Um, the other thing, you always want to make sure that everybody is accounted for, and that kind of goes hand in hand with where they're at. You know, if you have, um, if you close down the net and you have everybody check out, and everybody but one person checks out, and check secure off the net and this one person you can't get a hold of and you call and you call you try their cell phone you try them on the radio you know all these different ways to contact them but they're not answering for some reason so now you have go back to the first topic knowing where they're at so you find out where they were at on your log last time you talked to them and you send help that way and that's the first place that you look is where they were last seen at. You know, it could be that something happened and, you know, they were in an accident or, or uh, you know, God forbid the a tornado sucked them up or something like that. But, you know, always want to make, make sure you know where they're at and always want to make sure that they're accounted for. Um, case in point, I had, I was running a Skywarn net one day and we had wrapped up the net and there was one person that had not... Uh, secured with me and I called him and I called him and I called him and nothing uh, tried his cell phone nothing tried his house nothing uh, no matter where which mode of communications I went I couldn't reach him so we uh, like three or four of us went to where he was at last and didn't find anything and we finally called his house again and his wife answered 
and she says, oh yeah, he's been here for 30, 45 minutes or so. He's asleep now because he has to go to work tomorrow. Now, he didn't check out with me, so I didn't know that he was, you know, not secure. He had moved locations from where he had last talked to me at. I'm guessing that he was probably driving home from work or something and just didn't mention that. Just did like a quick, you know, this is what I see and, and that was it. Um, you know, but there for like 30, 45 minutes or so, we were all looking for this person and he was nowhere to be found. And come to find out, he was sound asleep in his bed. So you always want to make sure that you know where everybody is so that you can send help to where they were last known. And you always want to make sure that you can account for everybody. Now, on the flip side of that, if you are a net member, if you change locations or if you change frequencies, make sure you let the net control know so that they will have accountability for you. So next thing. Um, Next thing you really want to make sure is you know your radio. And also, if you can, have your manual in your uh, next to your station or easy access to your manual for your radio. Because you never know when something might not ha or might happen. You know, maybe maybe you accidentally hit a button and you like totally throw up your your radio. You know, you have to know how to get back to the frequency that you're using or the PL tone or whatever. So you always want to make sure that you know how to use your radio. And if you're not using your radio, say you're say you are running a net, uh, a Skywarn net and you go down to the emergency operations center to run the net. Well, you need to know how to use those radios. So you need to practice with them. And this is done, you know, a lot of times you can do this with a weekly club net or something like that. You know, you can go down to uh, your emergency operations center and use that radio to be net control. That will give you the help that you need, the training that you need, and the experience that you need with that radio. Now, going hand in hand with that, you also need to know how to use your logging program. If you use a, something other than a pen and paper, or pencil and paper, you need to practice with it. You need to learn what um, what boxes go or what information goes in what boxes or um, you know maybe how to quickly enter a new check-in you know a lot of times you'll have keyboard shortcuts um, built in programs and you can find those you know really easily because a lot of times you'll see like up in the menus there'll be a little uh, underlined letter and I'm sure that a lot of people know this but in case you don't, anytime you see an underlined letter, if you hold down the Alt key and press that letter, it brings up that menu. Well, not only that, but you also have other other keyboard shortcuts. A lot of times, if you bring up a menu in a program, there will be little shortcut keys listed for whatever the function is. Like for example, if you, uh, on most programs, actually pretty well all programs is pretty well standard on uh, PC. If you bring up the edit menu, you see your cut, your copy, your paste, and several other things. Well, the standard um, cut shortcut is Control X. The standard cop uh, copy shortcut is Control C, and paste is Control V. And there's several uh, shortcut keys that are like that that if you use your keyboard or that you can use to speed up your your uh, navigation skills I guess you could say within your program uh, you know a lot of times especially being net control you pretty well need to know how to type at least to a certain degree um, and it's best if you can keep from having to lift your hands off the keyboard to get to your mouse, to move your mouse, to click on the box that you want, to put your hand back on the keyboard, to type out the thing, and then to go back to your mouse and, and move it again. So, you know, if you can figure out how to use your program to uh, go to whatever box that you need to go to, w whether that be with a tab key or a shift tab key to go backwards, or... Um, you know, making a new contact, you know, sometimes that will be like control N, where you can make a new contra uh, contact. So there are several ways you can get faster at using that program uh, if you use a program. But my point is, out of all this, is that you really need to um, make sure that you know how to use the program before you're put into a position where you need to use the program. So know your radio and know 
any logging software that you use other than a pen and paper because I'm pretty sure everybody knows how to work a pen and paper. So next thing, um, if you make a mistake, acknowledge it, correct it, and move on. You know, everybody is human, right? Everybody is going to make mistakes. Everybody will eventually say something wrong or do something wrong. As a net control, your responsibility is to make sure that you tell people the right information, and you don't want to, you know, don't want to tell things that are not facts. And if you do do something that's incorrect, make sure that you own up to it. You know, not only will this make sure that whoever is listening to you has the correct information, but it will also gain that respect from your members that are on your uh, net that, hey, guess what? You are human, and you're not perfect. So if you make a mistake, own up to it, right? Um, next thing, make sure that um, you think before you key up. And this is, goes on both sides of the coin on this uh, instance, okay? You always want to make sure that you know what you're going to say before you say it, before you key up. Um, and especially in an emergency net, you know, there's always other people that are, that need to say something, right? So you always want to make sure that you know exactly what you're going to say before you even key up the radio. That way you can key up the radio, get acknowledged, key it up again, say what you need to say, and get off. You know, it kind of goes back to the old saying of, you know, uh, Actually, I don't know if I want to say this thing, but I'm sure that most of y'all know what I'm talking about. You know, do it and move on, basically. <laughs> but anyways, um, you know, you you don't want to go and key up on your radio and you're like, okay, this is a kilo uh, K5 CLM. Um, I'm looking off to the west. I see a bunch of rain and uh, the wind's kind of, oh, I don't know, like maybe 15 miles an hour. And I'm seeing some light coming down. It looks like some sun rays. And it's really pretty. Oh, and there's a rainbow too. And uh, uh, I guess that's about it. And then clear. You, know, you don't want to do that. You want to figure out what you're going to say. Okay, I'm going to say um, that I'm getting uh, heavy rain, that my winds are 15 miles an hour, and I'm done. You know, the rest of the stuff is just information that doesn't need to be passed on that nobody's going to be looking for. So you're basically taking up air time that maybe somebody else on the other side of the county has a tornado bearing down on them, and they can't key up on the radio and let everybody know that, hey, there's a tornado coming. Because you're too busy saying, oh, well, I see some light, you know, so think what you're going to say, key up, say it, get off, you know, don't dilly-dally around, don't give information that doesn't need to be relayed. And this also goes on the net control side, right? You want to make sure that when you key up, you say exactly what you need to say. Um, and also, you want to make sure that you... Um, let your members know that this is the information that I'm looking for, right? If you are net control in a Skywarn net and you have uh, person B on one side of, of your area saying, okay, I have a tornado bearing down on me, you don't want somebody on the other side of the county saying that they have, you know, light rain and it's clearing and there's no wind, right? So you need to make sure and say, okay, this is the information I'm looking for. I'm looking for only uh, information related to this tornado. Can anybody confirm it? Or when you first start up your net, you know, we're taking check-ins, please uh, come now with your full call sign or say your call sign phonetically or um, you come with your call sign in your grid location or something like that. Make sure that you say what you want exactly to know. And then on the other side of the radio, they know what they need to say so they can say it, right? So you always want to make sure that in your preamble or during your net, you always want to make sure that you tell people what you want to know, what you want to hear. Um, and you also need to make sure that you are constantly IDing um, the net so that people know that there's a net going on. You know, there's there's been times where there's been a um, we've had a Skywarn net up or some other kind of emergency net, and it'll be quiet for five minutes or something. Somebody will come on there and either one 
not listening to what's going on and just key up, or maybe they do listen for you know 10, 15 seconds and they don't hear any traffic, so they go ahead and key up and they call somebody, right? So you need to make sure that when you have a lull in your net that you say something to make sure that people are engaged, that people know that you do have a net going or what you're looking for and this is the perfect time for announcements you know right when you have a net that you're running and you get a lull you know that's the perfect time to say okay well this is the information that I'm looking for you know I'm looking for uh, inch at one at, uh, a rate of one inch per hour I'm looking for uh, wind gusts of over 25 mile an hour or pea size hail this is the information that I'm looking for you know you can also say something like if you say you're doing an Aries net after a tornado and you're doing cleanup and you have all these hams that are out doing damage assessment or cleanup or whatever and you say when you get to a lull in your net that's the perfect time to say okay well this is where um, you can find you something to eat and drink you know a Red Cross or Salvation Army or something like that has set up a feeding tent and this is where it's located this is where you can go to get food just make sure that you let me know that you're gonna go get food so make sure that you are engaged with your net members and that you always have something going and but on the flip side of that though you don't want to make sure that you you know you don't want to ID every time you unkey you know yes you want to make sure that you announce your net you know say every couple minutes or so you want you want to say this is the uh, uh, Johnson County Skywarn net or whatever every couple minutes, but you don't want to say every time you unkey, this is uh, K5CLM net control for the Johnson County Skywars net. You don't want to do that every time because that just takes up air that somebody else could be saying something. Okay, so next up, um, let's talk about the phonetic alphabet, right? You know, as hams, we use the international phonetic alphabet, right? You know, Alpha, Bravo, Charlie, Delta, Echo, Foxtrot, all that. But as hams in a non-emergency situation, a lot of times some hams will use, um, and I'm doing air quotes here, the cutesy phonetic alphabet or phonetics for their call sign. Um, you know, I heard one guy, I don't remember if it was, during, I think it was during a field day, I think, and he said his call sign was something like uh, W5... Uh, chicken fried steak or something like that it, so you know a CFS a chicken fried steak yeah that's you know kind of cool when you think about it okay I have a call sign that says chicken fried steak woohoo but on the flip side of that you know if you use that all the time when you get into emergency situation you're gonna say that phonetic uh, characters for your call sign and it can be distracting, right? I mean, if you're if you're taking check-ins and you have people coming in, you know, you have uh, uh, November seven Tom Delta Charlie and Kilo four Delta November Oscar, and then you have some guy that says you know whiskey five chicken fried steak. It's gonna kind of throw you for a loop a little bit, and you're gonna have to like pause and figure out exactly what they said so it's going to take time and it's going to take time away from you so make sure that you use the international phonetic alphabet that is standard for amateur radio don't use the QC stuff okay um, let's see next up having a backup having a backup I'm talking more than just having a, a backup radio a backup you know you need to have um, have a back definitely have a backup radio for sure um, if you if at all possible have a backup radio have a backup net control in case something happens to you say lightning strikes your house and you lose power and you're not on an emergency power if all of a sudden you stop talking on the net you need to have somebody in line to say okay well I'm in I'm in net control now um, and you need to say this on the net say it as part of your preamble you know this is uh, the Johnson County Skywarn net. Uh, I am net control. My backup is um, I don't know whiskey seven Charlie Delta or something like that. Um, just pulling a random call sign out of my head here. Um, be you know make sure that you 
have a plan for a backup net control and make sure that you announce it on the air. That way that person knows that, that they're backup as well and that everybody else knows that if something happens to you, net control is going to change. Now granted, if you you know are calling net control, you're not going to say, um, you know, Whiskey 7 Charlie Delta, this is Kilo 5 Charlie Lima Mike. You're not going to be saying that. You know, you're just going to be saying K5 CLM or you're just going to be saying um, net control K5 CLM, something like that. You're not going to be saying individual call signs for net control. So make sure you have a backup net control operator, but also make sure that you have a backup frequency as well. So you need a backup radio, you need a backup uh, net control operator, and you need a backup frequency. All this, with the exception of I have a backup radio, it needs to be set in the preamble. Okay, so you would say something like uh, the backup net control is Whiskey 7 Charlie Delta and our backup frequency in case something happens to this repeater is going to be on such and such a frequency. So that in, in case, you know, your backup net control is going to be there in case something happens to you. Something happens to your station. If you lose power, if you get hit by lightning, if you, you know, have to evacuate or have to go to the bathroom, you know, all these things can happen while you're in net control. So make sure you have a backup net control operator, and if at all possible, say, you know, I'm passing the net control to such such person because uh, you need to take a break or something. But then also if um, you all of a sudden go uh, silent, then everybody knows that net control is going to be changing. On that same token, if everything goes silent, and maybe you have a repeater issue, you know, you key up and you don't hear that courtesy tone come back to you, or you don't hear the repeater back to you, or nobody's talking to you, then something could be wrong with the repeater. So then you need to automatically change over to the other, uh, the backup frequency, the backup repeater. So have backups um, and have a plan. Those who don't plan, plan to lose. That's not the way that the the saying goes. I, I I had this like all planned out, but I didn't write it down, so I planned to fail. I guess <laughs> so. Plan to win instead of plan to lose, or plan to win so you don't lose, or something. I don't know. Somebody leave a comment in the show notes of today's episode. And let me know what that actual um, uh, saying is. Plan something about planning and not planning and you fail or something like that. But anyways, somebody leave a, a, a note for me, please. Um, okay, a couple more things. We're running kind of long here. So uh, make sure that you are respectful. Um, you know, just like with anything in your life, um, you have to show respect to get respect. If you are, if you trash talk somebody on the air or you correct somebody on the air or even off the air, um, you don't show them that respect, they're not going to give it back to you. So they're not going to be respectful for you. So make sure you're respectful because not only will that mutual respect uh, start to flourish, but there's also other people that are listening to your traffic, right? I mean, if you, like here locally, when we have a Skywarn net, not only do we have all of us that are listening, all the other ham radio community, but we also have, you know, elected officials, you know, mayors and judges and, and commissioners and uh, law enforcement and stuff like that that are listening to us, but we also have the general public. And I'm sure that's probably the same way everywhere that there's something like this happening. There's always going to be other people listening, so make sure that you are respectful, respectful to each other because if you're not, people are going to think you're a joke and they're not going to call on your services anymore. So, you know, they might say, well, we don't need a uh, ham radio operators to do this for us, to handle communication. So make sure that you are respectful, uh, not only on the air, but off the air as well. Um, being a net control, especially when you have a extended um, event, can get extremely tiring, right? You know, you have things coming from all sides of you, several radios that you're listening to, and maybe other people in the room. You know, you're focused on your radio. Um, it can get very tiring. So you don't want to stay net control for any more than two hours. Two hours are really the maximum standard that you should be in net control. If at all possible, do it sooner than that. You know, maybe every 30 minutes or maybe every hour or something like that if you have somebody that can take over for you 
um, but definitely no more than two hours because after that your brain gets really tired you can't focus as much and it can be really um, really tiring so no more than two hours to stay in that control uh, last thing we're going to talk about here, we're approaching the 40 minute mark, so last thing we're going to be talking about is tactical call signs. As an net control, using tactical call signs is a lifesaver at times. If you have, say, um, three shelters, a food distribution center, a, um, a command trailer, a uh, three EOCs that you're going to be talking to during a net, right? You have all these different things, and you have radio operators at every one of them. Rather than saying the call sign of the person that's there, you know, maybe there's two people that are at a shelter. Rather than saying, okay, um, whatever your call sign is at shelter, at this shelter, and then your call sign, rather than doing that, because you don't know who's going to be at the radio at the time, you can say shelter one, or, um, Cleburne EOC or Fort Worth EOC or Charlotte EOC or whatever or um, you know Fire Station 1 or whatever wherever you have a radio operator if it's a building that you're operating out of you can assign that as a tactical call sign um, something else that you can do like say for example uh, we used to do a bike race and we used to have a uh, operator um, shadow the um, the race director. So you could actually assign that a tactical call sign of say race director. That way in case it changed halfway through the race you wouldn't have to really remember or look up who is with the race director. Now using tactical call signs you still need to make sure that you know where everybody is and make sure that everybody is accounted for so that doesn't take away from what we said earlier but it makes it easier for whoever whether you're net control or not if say shelter one is trying to call shelter two they may not know that um, John Smith is now at, at shelter three or is taking a lunch break or something like that and Jane's uh, Jane Smith is now uh, who is at shelter two so if shelter one calls shelter two they can just say shelter one shelter two or shelter one k5 clm um, and do it that way so tactical call signs can be a lifesaver in situations where you have a lot of uh, quote unquote permanent uh, placements or um, areas you know you can even go as far as saying um, you know a different net or something you know resource net this is command or resource net this is k5 clm um, you don't always have to know or look up or remember who is doing what at each individual thing so you can use tactical call signs in their place that being said if you are at a shelter or at somewhere where there is a tactical call sign you need to make sure that you stay within FCC rules of uh, saying your call sign at the end of your transmission. So you can't just say, you know, this is shelter two clear. You need to say this is K5 CLM. Um, so, okay, that that pretty much wraps it up, I think, for today. We've kind of gone over long, longer than I wanted to on this topic. Um, I'm going to have a lot more information in the show notes. Um, this is just kind of a general overview, so make sure you check out the show notes, and you can find them at everythinghamradio.com forward slash podcast forward slash 45. So check those out. Check out the uh, extra um, information that I have on the show notes. And... Uh, yeah, I guess that about wraps it up. Let me know what you thought about it. Leave a comment below. If you have any other tips uh, or characteristics that you think would make a good uh, net control operator, leave them in the comments below, and uh, we can go from there. So, all right, uh, let's get on to our amateur radio club spotlight of this uh, episode. Okay, so the Amateur Radio Club Spotlight for this episode is going to be on the Columbia Amateur Radio Club. 
They are a service-oriented club and has been in, in existence for more than 40 years. Originally, they were known as the Carolina Repeater Association. It was an offshoot of the Palam Palmetto Amateur Radio Club, which is the oldest South Carolina amateur radio club, having been founded in 1928. Uh, around 1976, they changed the name from the Columbia Amateur or to the Columbia Amateur Radio Club to include a broader range of interests, not just repeaters. From the beginning, the club was active in promoting amateur radio, giving classes for new hams, maintaining a testing team, and so much more. You can find their website at www.w4cae.com or head on over to the show notes and there's a link that you can find there. They have a monthly meeting on the first Monday of the month at 7.30 p.m. at the SCETV Telecommunications Center, located at 1041 George Rogers Boulevard in Columbia, South Carolina. They have two repeaters. Uh, one of them is on the 146.775 repeater, has a PL tone of 156.7, and it's located in Fort Jackson. Their main repeater, from my understanding, is the 147.33 repeater. Uh, it also has a 156.7 tone, and it's located there in Columbia. They have a net each Sunday and Wednesday evenings at 8.30 p.m. on the 147.33 Zero repeater. So, if you are in the Columbia area, uh, either Sunday or Wednesday evenings, or maybe the first Monday of the month, make sure you head on over to uh, either those frequencies or that location and check out their uh, meetings and or nets. So, this club does quite a bit of stuff. They have an annual picnic. They do field day like most clubs do. Um, they also have workshops. They have workshops several times a month, I believe, uh, what I was reading. Um, on several different things. They hold license classes every other week. And actually, this coming, uh, this episode will be released on the 24th. And I believe they have a testing a license class starting on the, I want to say the first. I might have to look up on their website again here real fast and, and double check. Okay, so I just checked their website real fast, and actually it starts on the 7th. They have a testing on, or class on the 7th, 8th, and 9th, and then testing on the 10th. And it is uh, at from 6 p.m. to 10 p.m., um, the 7th, 8th, and 9th. It's there at the same location, the 1041 George Rogers Boulevard. Um, there is no cost for training, but $10 cash is needed for testing on Saturday. And the testing on Saturday will be at 9 a.m. Um, so check that out. Um, also, another thing that I noticed, um, I told you all the website is www.w4cae.com. Well, when I actually go to that website, it, it sends me to some um, to something else. So I'm going to have to get with I send a message to their webmaster and make sure that he's aware of that. But if you go to just w4cae.com, it will take you there, and I have updated the show notes as well. Uh, let's see, what else? Uh, like I said, they have testing sessions. Um, they do bike races. They do walkathons. They have their own ham fest. Um, last, last year's ham fest was the first Saturday in April. I don't know if it's going to be the same this year or not, but last year was the first Saturday in April. So check that out. So head on over, check out the Columbia Amateur Radio Club there in South Carolina. And uh, yeah, so that wraps it up for this spotlight. Let's head on over to the upcoming events. Alright, so upcoming events for the next two weeks. All the times that I'm going to be giving is Zulu time unless I specify otherwise. And all this information was taken from the WA7BNM BNM contest calendar that you can find in the show notes as well. Um, okay, so on the 25th from 145 to 215, we have the NCCC RTTY Sprint, followed by the regular NCCC Sprint uh, from 2.30 to 3 o'clock. Um, on the 26th at 0 hundred hours to the 27th at 2400 hours, we have the CQ Worldwide DX Contest on CW. November the 30th from 200 hours to 330 hours is the QRP Fox Hunt. That sounds kind of cool. Kind of cool. 
uh, and very interesting. Um, also on the 30th, from 2.30 to 3 o'clock, you have the phone fray. Uh, November the 30th, from 1,300 to 1,400, and 1,900 to 2,000 hours. And then on the 1st, from 3 to 400 hours, you have the CW Ops Mini CWT test. Uh, on November the 30th, from 2,000 hours to 2,100 hours, you have the UK EICC 80 meter contest. Um, on the 1st is the NRAU 10 meter activity contest. Um, from 1800 to 1900 is on CW. From 1900 to 2000 is on single sideband. 2000 to 2100 is on FM. And last but not least, the 21 to 2200 hours on digital. And on the second, we are back to the NCC CRTTY sprint from 145 to 215. And really weird, I'm not sure exactly what's going on with this, but on the calendar, it did not show the regular NCC sprint, uh, NCCC sprint from 2.30 to 3 o'clock on the second. Uh, I'm not sure exactly if it will be there or if it's not there, but uh, typically through these contests that I've been looking at, it typically follows... Um, right after the RTTY sprints. Uh, like I said, but it wasn't on the calendar. Um, okay, on the second, from 2 to 3.30 is the QRP Fox Hunt. Um, from 2.30 to 3 is, oh, there it is. 2.30 to 3 is the NCC sprint. Um, on the second, from 2,200 hours to December the 4th at 1,600 hours is the ARRL 160 meter contest. On December the 8th, from 0 hundred hours to 2,400 hours, is the uh, Terra, T-A-R-A-R-T-T-Y, Melly. And Wake Up QRP Sprint is December the 3rd, from 600 hours to 629, uh, from 630 to 659, uh, 7 to 729, and 730 to 800 hours, all on the 3rd. December the 3rd from 1600 hours to December the 4th at 1559 is the TOPS Activity Contest. December the 4th from 0 hundred to 2400 hours is the 10 meter RTTY Contest. From 1300 hours to 1600 hours on the 4th is the SARL Digital Contest. Uh, December the 6th from 200 to 400 hours is the ARS Spartan Co Sprint. Uh, December the 7th from 2 to 3.30 is the QRP Fox Hunt. Uh, also on the 7th, from 2.30 to 300 hours is the Phone Fray. And last for this two-week period, December the 7th, from 1300 to 1400, from 1900 to 2000, and on the 8th, from 3 to 400 hours is the CW Ops Mini CWT Test. Again, all the times that I mentioned are in Zulu time, and all of the information came from the WA7BNM calendar, uh, contest calendar. Okay, let's move on to Hamfest. We don't have a whole lot of them this time around, uh, being that is uh, getting close to Thanksgiving and Christmas. But let's go ahead and talk about what we do have. Okay, so on the 25th of November, we have the Fairlawn ARC Ham Radio Auction in Fairlawn, New Jersey. On the 26th, we have the OARC Ham Fest in the Woods in Okeechobee, Florida. That's kind of a fun name to say, Okeechobee. <laughs> um, on the 3rd, we have the Fulton County Winter Fest in Delton, Ohio. The SSRC 2016 Ham Fest in Osala, Ocala, O-C-A-L-A, Florida. Um, the Superstition Superfest 2016 in Mesa, Arizona. And on the 4th, we have the LCARC Amateur Radio Swap and Ham Fest in Madison Heights, Michigan. That is all of the Ham Fest that is in the next two weeks. Like I said, it is getting few and far between, being that we're wrapping up the year and coming up on the holidays. But all the information that, uh, that I have here comes from the ARRL Ham Fest calendar. Uh, you can find links to each of those ham fests and uh, events and stuff like that in the show notes of today's episode. Again, that's at everythinghamradio.com forward slash podcast forward slash 45. 
Okay, let's wrap up this episode with some news from around the hobby. Alright, so in our news for this episode, we start off with great news from the Rocky Mountain Division. Uh, Director Dwayne Allen, WY7FD, overcomes challenges to win the election. Uh, the AWRL Rocky Mountain Division Director Dwayne Allen, w 7 WY7FD has won election to a three-year term as vice director. Allen assumed the director's seat last January after the board of directors elected former director Brian Malshowski, uh, N5ZGT, as second vice director. Allen outpolled challenger Garth Crow, WY7GC, uh, 1,112 to 528 votes to win his to win the seat in his own right. Ballots were counted on November the 18th at the AWRL headquarters. The Rocky Mountain Division director seat was the only contested election for the 2017 to 2019 cycle. Allen pre- was served previously as Wyoming section manager from 2005 to 2007. New terms of office will begin on January 1st, 2017 at 12 noon Eastern Time. The work continues to strengthen relationship between amateur auxiliary and the FCC. Work continues to promote visibility of amateur radio enforcement within the FCC, the AWRL ex- Executive Committee was told recently. The EC met on October 22nd in Rosemount, Illinois. AWRL President Rick Roderick, K5UR, chaired the session. The AWRL General Council, Council Chris Imlay, W3KD reported that meetings have been held with the FCC concerning more effective FCC use of the volunteer resources of the Amateur Auxiliary Official Observers Program. The current FCC to AWRL Amateur Auxiliary Agreement and the development of a new Memorandum of Understanding that better incorporates the Amateur Auxiliary Program, especially in the light of the FCC's recent closing of field office and reduction of Spectrum Enforcement Division staff. The EC directed Second Vice President Brian Malski, N5ZGT, to continue work on the review and revitalization of the Amateur Auxiliary in cooperation with the FCC to ensure active use of the Amateur Auxiliary Program. In other FCC-related issues, the EC provided guidance in the domestic implementation of the worldwide amateur radio allocation at 5 MHz, agreed upon at World Radio Communications Conference 2015 last fall. Delegates to the WRC-15 reached consensus on 15 kHz wide band from 5351.5 to 5366.5, all stations limited to a effective isotropic radiator power of 15 watts. MLA, in, in conjunction with the AWRL International Affairs Vice President J. Bellows, K0QB, and Midwest Director, Division Director Rod Bloxham, K0DAS, will review the National Broadband Plan with an eye towards determining any impact it might have on amateur radio allocations. In addition, MLA and West Gulf Division Director David Woolweaver, W5RAV, will meet with officials of the Federal Aviation Administration and congressional offices to address the effects on amateur radio antenna systems between 50 and 200 feet tall of the new painting and lighting requirements required under the FAA Reauthorization Act, HR 636. I have a link to that text in the show notes of today's episode. The AWRL CEO, Tom Gallagher, NY2RF, told the panel that several new educational incentive initiatives are underway, and as the pilot programs and assesses, yeah, I cannot say that word, and refined, the program will make available to the amateur radio community. In his report, Bellows told the EC that the IARU Administrative Council has begun preparations to represent amateur radio at various meetings to be held in advance of the World Radio Conference in 2019. And great news on the new uh, AWRL repeater directory. 
the new AWRL repeater director will leverage crowdsourcing technology. The AWRL has partnered with RFinder, the creator of a web and app-based directory of amateur radio repeaters worldwide, will supply all the data for the 2017-2018 AWRL repeater directory. RFinder will employ its crowdsourcing technology to ag aggregate timely and accurate information for the directory, making the first time crowdsourcing has been put to use in production of the AWRL publication. Crowdsourcing is a means of using data gathered from public resources, in this case, repeater owners and frequency coordinators, via the internet to obtain a necessary listing information more quickly and flexibly. Including RF finders data in the repeater directory will help users seek the most complete listing of on-air repeaters. The repeater directory will continue to publish repeater listings according to the state, city, frequency, and mode. Although RF Finder's data is primarily, primarily user-supplied, AWRL has invited volunteer frequency coordinators to contribute their coordinated data to R Finder. R Finder has set up an online portal to accept uploaded data from coordinators. Every coordinator has that supplied repeated data to R Finder will have its listing credited as coordinated repeaters both in the RFinder smartphone apps and the web listings, and in the hard copy repeater directory. As part of the program, RFinder will make the RFinder database available to all frequency coordinators free of charge, with the exception of the Apple iOS version, which requires a $9.99 license. The Android-compatible database is a free download. We believe that this will help in the coordination activities as it provides you with a complete map of the machines, both coordinated and not, R Finder said. It also it will also assist coordinators to bring uncoordinated machines into coordination. The AWRL earlier this year established an agreement with R Finder to be the membership's association's preferred online resource for repeater frequencies. Our finder's steadily growing worldwide repeater database now includes more than 60,000 repeaters in some 107 countries around the world. Our finder's listing is listings are dynamic, reflecting regularly reflecting new, updated, revised, and deleted information. Our finder is integrated directly into Echolink on both Android and iPhone and provides the ability to share repeater check-ins on Facebook, Twitter, and APRS. Our finder is integrated with our T systems and Chirp radio program applications and has a routing feature that lets users find repeaters worldwide over a given route. Video demos of our finder's feature are available on YouTube. The AWRL had pre previously discontinued its own product that supported digital listings of the repeater data, including the Travel Plus for repeater software and its own apps. I actually had that that application and I actually liked it quite a bit. Uh, I guess I'll have to check out R Finder. Uh, let's see. Continuing. R Finder is $9.99 a year. Subscribe to R Finder by visiting uh, subscribe.rfinder.net from your iPhone, iPad, iPod Touch, or your Android smartphone or tablet. R Finder also includes the ability to report radio jamming anywhere. Those without a device or subscription can file a report online. Individuals or entities responsible for coordinating, coordinating anti-jamming activities can also request access to view jamming reports for the area. And we end our news segment with a sad note. South Florida Assistant Section Manager Ray Cassis N4LEM become SK. AWRL Southern Florida's Assistant Section Manager Ray Cass's N4LEM of Cocoa, Florida died unexpectedly on November the 9th. He was 69 years old. Licensed as WB4CTZ in 1966, he served the AWRL Southern Florida section for many years in various capacities, most recently as Space Coast District Emergency Coordinator and Assistant Section Manager. Cassis has been the Brevard County Emergency Coordinator since 1991, and he was instrumental in constructing several mobile communications units in the area. He was the owner of and on-air personality of WWBC Radio, where he maintained a second ham station. We have suffered a great loss in our section family with Ray's passing, said Southern Florida Section Manager Jeff Beals, WA4AW. Ray was a dear friend and a valued member of my section staff. 
All right, so that about wraps up this episode of the Everything Ham Radio podcast. If you like what you heard here, please share it with your friends. Please check check out the show notes of today's episode again that you can find at everythinghamradio.com forward slash podcast forward slash 45. If you would like to receive emails on when I publish a new uh, podcast episode or a new blog post, you can go to everythinghamradio.com forward slash subscribe. You will get an email with a link that you'll need to click on to confirm your subscription. After that, you will start receiving emails from me. If you would like to help out support this podcast, there are several ways that you can do it. You can do a one-time donation through PayPal. You can become a per-episode contributor through Patreon. Or you can simply shop on Amazon.com using my affiliate code. You will not notice a difference in price of anything, but I will get a small, like a finder's fee. So, uh, there are... Those are the three ways you can do it. You can find additional uh, information on how to do that at everythinghamradio.com forward slash support. Please follow me on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash everythinghamradio, on YouTube at youtube.com forward slash everythinghamradio, and on Twitter at K5CLM. If you like what you heard here, please share it with your friends. Please give me an honest review on iTunes, uh, Stitcher Radio, Google Play, wherever you are listening to, uh, and please comment... Uh, and uh, like I said, share this with your friends. So until next time, this is K5CLM signing out. 73, y'all.